Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I believe that Turkey will intervene on behalf of the Palestinians. And I believe that there will be another Holocaust. Secular and religious Turks are both united in their support of the Palestinians. The Turks deny their own genocide of the Armenians. They are pro-Palestine. I believe Turkey and Iran unite in their hatred for Israel. One of uh, Turkey's major politicians, Muhammad Ali Fatih Erbakan, has called for a worldwide Islamic uprising against Israel. He's also called for the throwing out of the U.S. ambassador from Turkey and as well as the prosecution of Turkish Israeli citizens who joined the IDF and for the enabling of Iran to attack Israel. Now these are just a few of the reasons I have many. I stand by my statement back in 2018 that it is Turkey that invades Israel, not Russia. And I believe Germany is involved. Germany's longing for freedom is perceived uh, by many as, as, as being impeded by Israel and a, a group of Zionists with a loud voice. The fact that the greatest extermination of the Jews was done by Germany, will we be led back to the horrific past when the European uh, nation of Germany tried to exterminate the Jew. I think so. Because of their hatred toward the Jews and their desire to be freed from the American chains of restriction, which is now hindered by America's support for Israel. Germany wants to do business with the Iranians while the U.S. continues to pressure other countries not to do so. There are so many factors that when you add it all up, you sort of begin to get a picture here. Germany's federal foreign minister uh, wrote that it is essential that we strengthen European autonomy by setting up payment channels that are independent of the United States of America, creating a European monetary fund. We haven't talked a lot about Germany, but I believe they, they play a tremendous role in all of this. The Germans no longer want to be in submission to the United States. It wants to break free from us here in the U.S. to pursue its own business dealings whether it's with the Russians or the Iranians or whoever. So I stand by my statement that it is Turkey in end times prophecy, not Russia. Turkey is the king of the north. If you look at that geographically on a map, it goes to Turkey. It doesn't go to Moscow. Major Turkish official, uh, uh, officials are calling for the entire Islamic world to make war with Israel and wants to enable Iran to attack Israel. I've done several video, videos on, on, on Erdogan. I believe that he uh, sees himself as playing a major role in uh, reviving the Islamic, uh, the, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Islamic Caliphate. He wants to head this Islamic, Islamic Caliphate. There are many nations who want to attack Israel, but Turkey wants to be take a front seat to all of this. Not Russia. Now, th this is what I believe. I don't ask anyone else to agree with me. You're going to hear a lot of things in this video that you may not agree with, and that's fine. 
I want you aware right up front that what I present to you tonight is in no way a detailed explanation of exactly what's going to happen. I, I don't think God's given us that. I believe that biblical prophecy is there that we might rejoice in the fact that our Lord, first of all, has a plan. He does have a plan. And secondly, He is in absolute control. I do believe that He's given us enough that we won't be surprised and that He's outlined the characteristics of this seven-year period which we refer to as, well, the generic name is the tri tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week. I believe it's a literal seven years because the first 69 were. The first 69 groups of seven were literal seven-year periods. There's no reason to believe that the last one uh, of the 70th isn't also a seven-year period. It actually comes within seven days of being a seven-year period. The thing that's significant about that is that that's most of biblical prophecy. Most, that is the bulk of unfulfilled Bible prophecy, deals with that seven-year period. And many of us are aware of its characteristics. You know, it's, it's not my intention to go down the list and talk about all of that. War, pestilence, famine, death, and so on and so forth. One of the characteristics is the predominance of false religion. Babylon. I don't believe that there are two Babylons, you know, because there's the destruction of another Babylon. That appears to be another one. But it's the same one. It is the close alliance between the religious system and the political system, religious and political, and the business economy. There's a fellow named Eugene Carson Blake, he, who was at one time head of the National Council of Churches, who said that the churches in the United States alone control over $100 billion in assets. They conduct business and they pay no taxes. They have trust funds, uh, retirement funds in excess of three to four billion dollars. There is no reason, and I'm quoting him here, there's no reason that the churches could not control the economy of the United States Now, how much that may change once the body of Christ is gone, removed, we, we here at Blessed Hope Forever are pre-trib. I don't know. But Revelation chapter 17 apparently makes it clear that whatever the false religious system is, and it's been around since the days of Babylon, you know, the building of the Tower of, of, of Babel and Babel, and so forth. There's been very little change in that system. We try to make it more sophisticated, but the earmarks of the Babylonian mysteries are clearly evident in many false religions today. And this includes what I believe is the major end time religion, Christianity's counterfeit, which is Islam. And I think what God is telling us is that with the removal of the body of Christ, there will be a predominant control uh, of false religion and false teaching. However, that 17th chapter closes with the business and political system destroying that woman, Babylon. They'll hate the whore, desolate, naked. It'll, it shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire, for God has put it in their hearts to fulfill His will. And so the economic system, the political system, will destroy the religious system. There'll be great conflict between those 
systems in the 70th week of Daniel, which is what we refer to as the tribulation period, the time of Jake, Jacob's trouble. I am in no way suggesting that it's the same thing. I am simply saying that we see in, in our country that same type of conflict between the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Many of you may be, may be aware of this. Many of you may not be. The, the, the Bill of Rights is a deistic document. The Constitution is more of a Calvinistic document. Deism. Deism is the belief in God based on reason rather than revelation or, or the teaching of any specific religion that's what's known as deism. The word originated in England in the early 17th century as a rejection of Orthodox Christianity. We, on the other hand, are theistic. We are not deistic. And if you think that they go together, well, you haven't read them. But that's neither here nor there. There was this conflict back when this country was founded, and it was a small conflict. Comparatively speaking, we can, we can only imagine what it'll be like in the 70th week of Daniel. Of course, we're not going to be here. The church will not be here during that 70th week. Now, there's some reason that the economic and the political system would turn against the religious system. For they do go well hand in hand, and they always have. The religious system has always preceded the political environment. It has in this country, the United States. It has in other countries. And it'll be very, very much more evident in the 70th week of Daniel. There has to be some reason why this happens. We need to look at, at the close of this 70th week of Daniel. But I really don't want to call it the I really don't want to call it the close. I, I want to look at the conflict that I think is going to be prevalent in the 70th week of Daniel. I can't tell you what's going to happen in the 70th week of Daniel. What I want to do is try to put together what it seems to me the Word of God says that would bring these things to pass. If the religious system, the political and economic system are working well together, there's no conflict. So I want to look at the conflicts of the 70th week of Daniel tonight. I am fully convinced, fully persuaded, the conflict begins with, not a Russian, but an, an invasion of Muslim nations into the land of Palestine. I believe current events validate that argument. What I do know without question is in Ezekiel 38 and 39, there is a northern invasion into the land of Palestine. Many believe that to be Russia. Uh, I'd say for generations, we thought that that was Russia. As we've gotten closer to this, I don't think that's the truth. Ezekiel 38 and 39, the chief prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. You know, people have gone to great lengths to identify that as Moscow and, and Lydia and, and so forth. I do not believe that, and I am not going to spend time trying to define what those countries are because I've done that in other videos, and other, others have done that as well too. They are, without question, all Muslim nations that invade Israel. All of them. Now, if you believe this is Russia, well, consider this. There's a poll that was conducted in April of 2022 by the Independent Levada Center, 
which found that 71% of the population of Russia identified as Orthodox Christian, while only 5% identified as Muslim. Orthodox Christianity being the most widely professed faith in Russia. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, it is God who gives them the idea that they're going to go up against the land of unwalled villages. Again, I want to say this is Turkey. Now, there's any amount of written material in, in the theological uh, world uh, out there that deals with that subject and says that the reason it's, it's an unfortified land is because a covenant has been made with Israel guaranteeing their security, their safety, and therefore they can disarm. And Russia suddenly says, wow, there's a lot of assets down there and, and it's a you know, it's a good direct path to the oil fields and, and, and they, don't, they don't have any arm, armament anymore. They don't have any weapons anymore. So, so we'll invade. We'll invade. Bear in mind that Russia or Israel does not have to disarm and doesn't have to get rid of their air force, their marvelous air force, and their standing army in order for Ezekiel 38 to be explicitly correct. The only thing that would make Israel an unarmed camp, in my opinion, would be for her allies to withdraw their support. The reason that why the, that we, the United States, are, are Israel's ally is because of God. But there's going to come a time when Israel is going to be hated of all nations for His name's sake. It seems to me under the authority and the rule of the, the beast of Revelation 13, many nations, if not all nations, are going to withdraw their support for Israel. And that leaves Israel then the prey of her enemies. Because Israel can't do it alone. And I believe that's God's intention. It's God that saves Israel, not Israel that saves Israel. In any event, I'm told by God in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that Turkey, not Russia, decides to invade Israel. And they come as a great invading army into the land of Israel. And they are destroyed by natural, I'm going to put that in quotes, natural forces. It's God who actually rains hailstones on them and fire and brimstone from heaven. If you want to call that natural, I, you know. And he does this as a testimony that he's God Almighty. That is an amazing passage of Scripture. There are those who believe that that's already taken place, that it was fulfilled in past history, but they can't point to anything that is anything like the prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and 39. So the predominant feeling among Christians today in the main is, well, it hasn't happened yet, but it's future. I'm absolutely persuaded that is going to happen before the rapture or before the removal of the body of Christ. How much of this we're going to see, I, I have no idea. These things evolve slowly. In my personal opinion, I don't think the United States is going to turn completely against Israel until the body of Christ has been removed. Even though we are withdrawing some of our support today, I heard on the news today, Biden's reversed his decision to withhold arms from Israel for Rafah. But we still support Israel. I don't think it's going to happen before the removal of the church. If it is to happen before the removal of the body of Christ, then Christ can't come tonight. Unless, unless the rapture is in fact what triggers Daniel's 70th week, which has always made sense to me. Consider the 
the enormity of this, of this event and the ramifications of it. Therefore, the biblical concept of imminency remains intact. Folks, why would the non-Christians who are left behind continue to support Israel? I'm going to suggest that they don't. Eminency refers to the church, not the tribulation saint. No tribulation saint inside Daniel's 70th week can intelligently claim that the second, Christ of, uh, second coming of Christ is, in, is, is imminent. Uh, there will be those who will know it is not imminent because they know the week is seven years and they got a calendar and they can count. We're not able to do that. They will be able to do that. If, if the United States completely abandons Israel with the church still here, then the whole concept of imminency, which I believe to be part and parcel of Scripture, that we are to watch and pray, we would now know when the Lord's coming. And if the Invasion precedes the return of the Lord for the church. Well, then he can't come tonight. Because that all out, full scale invasion has not happened yet. I think we're on the brink, but it hasn't happened yet. And I don't think that fits biblical prophecy. In Ezekiel chapter 37, we have the vision of the dry bones. And I think almost all, a Christian, all Christians agree that's a vision of the restoration of the nation of Israel for many, many years that was absolutely considered to be impossible. You know, nobody in the year 1900 would have ever dreamed that Israel could be a nation with a, a standing army, uh, a an amazing air force, the electronic capability, flying their flag among the United Nations, couldn't happen. Couldn't happen. Absolutely could not happen. So Ezekiel 37 is a miraculous passage of Scripture. Tells, you, tells us right where we're at. Ezekiel 37 is dealing with the restoration of the nation Israel. Ezekiel 40, if you go past, you know, 38, 39, is dealing with the installation of the kingdom. 38 and 39 are between the national restoration and the kingdom age. The beast of Revelation 13 sets up a government. People are looking for a government to take care of them. I mean, we're doing that today. There's still uh, enough conservative voices that would fight against, against that. But people want it. You know, the left uh, here in the U.S. Uh, is anti-capitalist. We have every indication that we seem to want government interfering in every aspect of our lives. And it's nothing folks. Nothing today compared to what it's going to be. The Antichrist system is going to set up that government and be a world authority. Israel is not going to like that. A lot of people aren't going to like it. But the masses are going to welcome it. It isn't that they're forced to, to take the mark of the beast. They will demand it. They will want it in that environment. You'd be surprised at what the mark of the beast really is. I've done videos on that. I believe this invasion occurs at the middle of the week, as many do. You know, globalist Google was no coincidence. It basically owns us. It has since 1998. You know, in just 26 years, look at how Google's evolved. My point is simply this. Many of the things which characterize the 70th week of Daniel are staring us right in the face today. 
But see, we become acclimized. How you say it? Like the frog in the boiling pot of water. I mean, you know, we, we, it's in the 14th verse of Revelation 12, Israel flees into the wilderness and is protected and nourished the three and a half years. Why three and a half years? This is the 70th week of Daniel. Why isn't it seven years? Now, I'm going to suggest that things aren't that bad for Israel in the first three and a half years. I'm not alone in that belief. There are many who believe that as well. I believe Turkey invades the land and God destroys them. In Ezekiel 39, we're told that God says that the way He destroys them is a testimony to the nations that He is God. Wow. With a a testimony like that, they're all going to get well. They're all going to get down on their hands and their and knees, and they're going to beg God to forgive them. Not at all. They turn against God, and they turn against Israel. At that time, Israel is hated by all nations for His name's name's sake. There are people that hate the Jews today, but they don't hate them for Christ's namesake. In most cases, people can't put their finger on any case where they've been hated of all nations for His namesake. But when Turkey is destroyed on the mountains of Israel, and that could include Turkey's allies. And it's apparent to the world that it is a supernatural force that did it. And it isn't the religious system of the day. Israel's going to wake up. I don't believe that that's the moment that they look on, on him whom they pierced and mourn. But I believe Israel is going to wake up. There's going to be a, a marvelous preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. And Israel is going to be hated of all nations for His name's sake. That's why it's three and a half years. That means the armies of a Turkey-led coalition are essentially destroyed before the big military campaigns that close out the week, begin, you know, be, begin. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11, verse 36. Uh, the beast of Revelation 13. He's the one that does according to his will. He's the one that exalts himself above every god and, and so forth. Why exalt himself above every God? Every God. I believe part of that is due to the fact that God has revealed himself in power during the 70th week of Daniel. If you look at verse 40, at the time of the end, which is exactly what it says in Ezekiel 38, in the latter days, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. A whirlwind. Now there are various opinions. You know, the king of the south is generally thought to be Egypt. But there are varying opinions about the king of the north. In Scripture, in your Bible, the King of the North is that which is north of Israel. And that surely applies to Turkey. But it also applies to other countries. And it seems like uh, there's two situations here. The King of the North pushes at him, comes at him uh, like a whirlwind in many ships, many ships, uh, enter into, into the picture 
why should the beast of Revelation 13 set up his headquarters in Israel? Why should he do that? Because he went into Israel. Because of Turkey's invasion. Turkey is destroyed. It's obvious that God did it. But here is a world ruler who magnifies himself against every god, any god. So in defiance, he sets up his government in, in Israel. Of all the places to put it, that's where he puts it. And now he has problems. He's going to show that God is not God, that God is not supreme, that He is. He magnifies Himself above any God. The beast of Revelation 13 moves into Israel and sets up His government there. And so what we have, basically, is a an Islamic confederacy that's, that's devastated in the land of Israel. And it takes seven months to clean up the land. Seven months. There's another seven for you people out there that love sevens. The beast of Revelation 13 in agreement with the religious system sets up his government and his political system in the nation of, of Israel. And a great time of trouble begins in the middle of the week. Not that there wasn't difficulty before, but great difficulty from the middle of the week on forward. We refer to that as the Great Tribulation Period. He professes to be the world leader and the world dictator. Uh, ten nations agree to submit to him for one period of time called one hour. And, uh, and that's beginning to fall apart. Uh, we have uh, what are called the campaigns of Armageddon. It begins with uh, these nations fighting each other for dominance in the world, uh, in, the, in the world political system. The first thing that they're going to do is throw off the religious system. I believe because of the evidence that God has given in the destruction of Turkey that the world is going to be in conflict. It's going, it's going to be in conflict over the religious system. So the nations are going to despise and destroy that religious system. No longer be under its influence. There will there will be great conflict in the nation Israel. There will be one religious system, but it will be destroyed in the last half of the 70th week. I think that they'll all join into one false religious system. Okay, now when we turn to Zechariah, with all of this going on, we see a great conflict for world dominance. And that conflict, by God's design, is taking place in the land of Israel. It's by many people called the Battle of Armageddon. It's, it's no battle, it's a big campaign. It, 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 basically, it extends from the northern part of Israel down to the south, uh, of the city of Jerusalem covering the whole land. It's an, an enormous conflict. We're told in the, the back in the book of Re Revelation, we're told that the blood runs to the horses' bridles for 1,200 furlongs. A furlong is used in the Bible as a unit of, of distance. It's, it's one-eighth of a mile uh, the Bible uses a, a Greek unit, uh, a stadion, uh, approximately 600 feet, and it was translated to furlong, an English term, uh, 660 feet, one-eighth of a mile, 1,200 divided by eight, 
uh, reveals that to be 150 miles. Now in Zechariah 14, we read that the day of the Lord cometh and thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem. That's why they're there. Now you can say, well, uh, you know, they're there as a result of the invasion. You can say, you know, they're there because of conflict in Israel. You can say, you know, they're there because the so-called religions of the world, the, the major ones, you know, were centered in the city of Jerusalem. But in the last analysis, they are there because God gathered them there. Gathered them against Jerusalem. And the devastation is unbelievable. These are God's people. But I read the city is taken before the Lord returns. The city of Jerusalem is going to be sacked. It's going to be taken. The houses are, are going to be plundered. The, the women are ravished. Uh, half of the city is taken captive. At least half. The, the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city because God makes a way of escape for them. And it's then that the Lord shall go forth and fight against these nations. This is why I believe there's a gap between the second coming and the beginning of the kingdom. They're going to destroy the city of Jerusalem and all of a sudden then the Lord goes forth and it's under His design. They're doing exactly what He decreed for them to do. They're going to come against Jerusalem to battle. And the Lord shall go forth and fight against these nations. They don't stand a chance. Comparatively speaking, this, this would be like a, oh, I don't know, you know, like the... the, the Choctaw Indians are going to take over the United States and they're going to establish a government and they're going to re reinstitute their tribal systems. You know, I mean, just that's just not going to happen. The Lord has ordained that these nations go against Jerusalem to battle. God has a plan and it will be carried out precisely. In, with precision, great pre precision. It's God that brings these nations against Jerusalem. They'll all have their logistics. They'll all have their reasons for being there and their battle plans and their, their weather forecasts or whatever before they make this invasion. But it will be God who goes forth and fights those nations. The text says, as when he fought in the day of battle. He can do that. Our God can do that. He took the wheels off the chariots in the mud and the rain and He rained meteorites down, you know, from heaven on the, the enemy forces of Israel. And those meteorites were up there for God knows how long, only knows how long, just waiting for God to use them as bullets it's all laid out in His plan. None of it happened by chance. We don't worship a God of chance. We can uh, go back in the Old Testament and we can see time and time again when God delivered His people. He's the one that's going to do the fighting. Listen to me, dearly beloved. He's the one that's going to do the fighting. And the same is true in your life and mine. You are not doing the fighting. You just think you are. And in that day, when He goes forth to fight these nations, these people who were mortal enemies fighting each other suddenly become allies and turn against the Lord. You may say, well, you know, it's, 
It is inconceivable that any human would fight God, and yet his own people have a history of fighting against him. It's all the flesh does. I don't care how much military equipment they have there and how many millions of people that they may have in their army or their armies. Turns out it's not enough. No matter how much effort you put forth to produce righteousness, you can't produce one bit. Okay? It's not sufficient to secure any kind of meaningful victory. The same is true in our lives. To turn against God is typical of the flesh, of man's total rejection of God, His authority and His power. The rich man didn't ask to come where Lazarus was. He asked Lazarus to come where he is, or he was. I don't think anybody in hell wants to be with Christ. They, they turn against Him to fight a losing battle. They don't have a chance. They don't stand a chance. They ought to know that. We know that they cry for the rocks and the caves to fall on them, to, to hide them from the wrath of God. They know it's God, and yet they'd rather pray to a cave or a rock. We read that when he comes back, there's a great valley so that people in the city of Jerusalem can flee. The valley's not there now. It will be. I don't, uh, I don't know whether Mediterranean water is going to run into the Dead Sea and whether we have a, a, a river between the Mediterranean and, and the you know, the, the Gulf of Aqaba. I don't know. I don't know what that gulf is going to be, but God's going to change the topography in this area when He fights for His people. Just as God will move heaven and earth to fight for you and I. It's going to be a cloudy day, a day of vengeance, and a day of battle. And this is the end then, the culmination of the 70th week of Daniel. There's so much in between. I could spend every day until He comes talking about it. But the Lord will be king over all the earth. The beast of Revelation 13 thought that He was. That's what he was trying to set up. The Lord is king over all the earth. In that day, there's one Lord and His name will be one. Israel has always loudly boasted that their God is one. The Lord our God is one God. And now they'll see, they will see Him as their Messiah. That He's God of very God as well as man of, of very man. The God-man Jesus Christ. And I believe it's at this time that they look upon Him whom they pierced and they mourn. Will we be here to see this? Could very well be. This, this doesn't happen in a 24-hour period, but over time, constantly, it's constantly evolving toward a climax, so it's possible that we see a lot of things unfold before we're taken. How much? I have no idea. I don't believe any man does. But I think it is our obligation, our duty, our responsibility, our privilege to continue looking up For our redemption draweth nigh. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.